everyone. Good morning, good evening, good night. This is Alafia Stewart, Learning Director of the Melton Foundation, and now we will have our very first Melton Foundation Hot Topics podcast with two of our lovely new fellows that will introduce themselves shortly. The Hot Topics podcast is a junior fellow initiative where we are building bridges and intentionally having conversation around interculturalism and what's going on around the world. So with that, I'd like to pass it over to our lovely new fellows. Please go ahead and introduce yourself. Hello, everyone. I'm Sangeeta, and I'm a new fellow from BMS College of Engineering in India. Hi, uh, everyone. I am Xiao Yun Mei, a new fellow from China, Zhejiang University. All right, thank you so much for introducing yourselves. And so what we're gonna be talking about in today's Hot Topics podcast is an array of things. Um, but the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna to touch on the subject of technology. I've brought us some things that are going on in their respective localities that they are passionate about. And the first one up is that Samsung is launching solutions for deaf, blind, and visually impaired in India. So Sangeeta, take it away. Yeah, thank you so much, Alafia. Uh, here, this is one of the greatest technological advancements which is most spoken about in the Indian headlines since the last few weeks. Uh, Samsung, which is India's biggest and most trusted electronics and smartphones brand, has recently introduced two new unique solutions, the Relumino and Good Vibes. They have basically enabled the deaf blind to be more aware of the community around them and to also be able to speak to their near and dear ones with more comfortability they help provide a strong communication tool to these people and enable people with low vision to see better too good vibes which is developed in india actually enables the deaf blind to have a two way communication with their loved ones using their smartphones. The app basically uses Morse code to convert vibrations into text or voice and vice versa. The, the app basically has two different user interfaces. Uh, one of those interfaces has an invisible port for the deaf blind, which uses your vibrations and taps, while the other is a standard chat interface, which we generally use. Uh, the DevBlind interface can be used by the DevBlind person who actually would be able to type in a combination of dots and dashes to send across their messages. The other interface, which is a standard interface, allows these users to use voice to send out their messages to the DevBlind. The a voice which is received to these people as vibrations can be converted into Morse code and can be interpreted by the deaf blind. Uh, so basically, this is one of the most novel technological advancements in the recent times in Indian history. Uh, the Relumino is another app which was also recently developed by the employees of uh, the Samsung branch in India. Uh, it's basically a visual aid application for people to be able to view better with lower vision. Uh, it enables them to see images clearer by magnifying, minimizing images and whatnot. They would also be able to highlight the image outline and adjust color contrasts and whatsoever. So as part of its citizenship initiatives, uh, Samsung is actually partnered with a non-profit organization called Sense India, which improves the lives of the deaf blind in the country. So they have partnered with this organization to promote and market the Good Vibes and the Relumino app across the country. Samsung has also conducted training workshops for these educators in the organizations and the deaf blind individuals. Uh, they have also pro provided smartphones uh, to the poor deafblind people with these apps already installed so that it could benefit them in the longer run and po poverty not affecting their uh, communication tool. 
uh, Samsung has also launched a digital uh, video that is actually super emotional and it shows the impact of these apps that can have on the life of an individual. Uh, the YouTube link which I would be sharing with you guys later. This video showcases a deafblind girl who shares a really special bond with her mother even though they can't talk to each other. But when distance comes between them, her mother seeks a new way to communicate with her daughter. So this app has not only affected this girl but has been a novel method for millions of deafblind people around India to communicate with their near and dear ones. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. So I'd like to open the floor and ask both of you how you think um, folks with disabilities, particularly the deaf and the blind, are integrated into your local environments um, and what technologies are being developed uh, like this one. So I'll open the floor. Tell me what's going on. What is what is the cultural climate around disability in general, particularly with the deaf blind where you both are? Actually, I don't know. I don't know a lot about the technology, especially designed for blind or deaf people. But I know that there is a change in our uh, college uh, college admission exams. Like they're uh, they're providing specially made uh, text test papers for the blind people. So the test paper was written in you know the dots mm -hmm. like the. the Blind, the blind students can uh, touch on the stars and know what the test paper is talking about. And it is being widely used in college uh, admission exams nowadays. So I think that this is a really smart move for them. Like more, it's like giving equal uh, educational opportunities to the blind people. Like if they get into college and you know, most blind students, they cherish the educational opportunities a lot. So they're going to grasp those opportunities and make the best out of them. So I think it is quite an innovative move. Nice, nice. Um, I, you guys don't know this, but before coming to the Melton Foundation, I worked in uh, disability advocacy for about five years. And so, oh. yeah, yeah. And so some, this subject is really near and dear to my heart because as I've traveled, um, I've found that even with technology, the biggest barrier to people with disabilities being integrated into the world is not actually the technology. It's the mindset mm -hmm. and the culture of the people. Um, there's still, it's still very, very prevalent for folks to have stereotypes around um, disabilities everywhere from anything from mental health to um, physical capabilities. Um, if you're someone who has a disability, there still seems to be very much the societal stigma around it. Mm -hmm. So I'm interested in finding out if it, what those, what the climate is or what the conversations are around disability in both of the places where you guys are. Um, Sangeeta, can you give me some more insight as to how disability is viewed um, where you are in India? Yeah, so actually uh, there are a lot of opportunities for people who are disabled and physically challenged in India. Right from their educational institutions to the workplace, they have uh, a special kind of attention and a um, few measures that have been taken in the respective places for them to stay in a coherent environment and they being inclusive with all the other people. So as you may already uh, spoke about the educational institutions providing opportunities, it's the same case in India too. They have writers and uh, braille script writers who actually help the deaf blind people to, you know, like write exams and uh, compete with other people in the normal sense. And even in the uh workplaces i've heard that there are few organizations which provide uh, a jump for these people to directly go to the interview rounds without attending uh, the aptitude and the logical reasoning exams or whatsoever so like i've heard that they directly take such people to the interview round i'm not really sure about this but i think that uh, there are a lot of measures in india 
to make the deaf blind people inclusive into the normal environment mm. awesome that's awesome to hear because when we talk about disabilities and unfortunately in a lot of western media outlets there's this idea that um Western societies are um, doing a better job in catering to, to folks with disabilities and that, you know, that they're just ahead in all of these other areas. And I think it's really important for the discussions around disability advocacy and inclusion and access to be one that that's inclusive, <laughs> inclusive of everyone around the world and, and a recognition and um, an encouragement for um, societies and environments to make these sort of technologies. And it's really great to see that this is something that humanity as a whole is embracing, that we need to do something so that we can even the playing field and provide an environment for those who may have a disability um, to be able to live the fullest lives that they can. All right, and is there um, anything else you'd like to add to this subject? And I have a, I have, I have some questions for sure. this topic. Like I really, uh, since I think this fantastic for blind and uh, deaf people all around the world to have great access to it. So I want to ask: Is this app developed by Samsung's like India branch, or uh, is and is this app now only available in India? or is it going to be uh, in the app store like all around the world someday? Yeah, so both the apps have been developed by the Indian branch of Samsung. And as of mm -hmm. now, these apps are downloadable only in uh, the Samsung Play Store. And uh, there are few news headlines stating that uh, Samsung is soon gonna partner with Google uh, yeah. and then spread across this app around the world so that in a few months from now we would be able to download both the apps from the Google Play Store as well. So I oh, think that's in, really the next, cool. maybe in the next two to three months the app would be available all over the world and all the deaf blind people around could be able to make use of it. Then um, moving on to and staying within the technological field, let's go ahead and talk about the Harmony iOS system out of China. So you may take it away. Yeah, uh, the Harmony OS, the Harmony operating system, is developed by Huawei Technology Co. It was unveiled in uh, in August, and they remain to be one of the hottest uh, topics in China in the last few weeks. Uh, this operating system in Chinese is called Hongmen, and in English its name is Harmony. It's it's a, a very lovely name. Like Harmony means you know the kind of it can represent some of China's spirits and other you know uh, other meanings. And this uh, operating system it is not used on the phone, which is quite surprising for us. It is instead it is used on like all of these other devices like the Internet of Things. The reason why this operating system came up was that was because of US government's restrictions over the use of Google's Android operating system in smartphones and other hardwares. Because like uh, Google said in an announcement that its Android operating systems and all of its apps will no longer uh, support updates on Huawei devices. So uh, that's the reason why Huawei chose to develop this OS. Since the OS is in it is now going to be applied only on you know other digital devices, but if uh, if necessary, it is also going to be used on phones. So it's kind of so it can somehow replace the uh, Android if Android is no longer available on Huawei uh, Huawei's cell phones. And also, um, you know, the reason why we are kind of surprised to learn that uh, people in China are kind of surprised to learn that uh, the Harmony OS came out was that it just came out so quickly because we know that hard developing an operating system takes quite a long time. And, you know, it just came out like weeks after Google announced that the Android is no longer Able, uh, available to update on Huawei devices. So it proves that it was, uh, so it was, looks like 
Huawei has been preparing the plan B for Android for a long time. We're kind of, we're very happy to learn that anyway. Huawei is like one of the biggest technology companies in China. And it's, in China, it is famous for its uh, uh, ability to innovate new things, you know, from phones uh, to other devices and now to the operating systems. But it is also kind of surprising that it is uh, the, uh, the Harmony OS is going to be applied on the Internet of Things. Because usually in China, we don't go to Huawei for other digi small digital devices. We go to another technology company called Xiaomi. So it was also quite ambitious move for Huawei. Like it's going to not only, uh, it's not only uh, focusing only on phones anymore. It's also going to shift its uh, focus to other devices. So it's quite a strate strategic move. Yeah, so much for this. And also another definition to mention is that Huawei says this, uh, this operating system is going to run on the microkernel. The microkernel is like a uh, minimal software structure for operating system mechanisms. For example, Android runs on 100 million lines of code, but Harmony OS, according to Huawei, runs on just 100 lines of code. So it's quite impressive, like the contrast between the number of codes. But since the Harmony OS has not uh, been put into use yet, we have no idea whether the, uh, the difference between the kernel is going to affect the experience of we using it. Okay, so much for this. All right, so um, after reading a little bit about Harmony, the operating system, um, and looking up what a microkernel is, because I definitely didn't know what that is. Uh, so what do, you, what do you see as being like the major impact? So from what I read, if Harmony operating system works out, it will be able to be used across any device. And I think yes. that when we're talking about technology and we're talking about inclusion and we're talking about mm -hmm. worldwide reach, it seems that if, Huawei can pull this off, that this is going to be an incredible innovation in mobile technology or technology in general. Yes, for example, actually now the Internet of Things like the uh, OS on all of the devices are mostly Android, but now but, but it seems like Huawei has developed an independent version of OS which can be applied on those things. So it, uh, you don't have to rely on uh, another company to, you know, to develop the OS. Huawei can do it by himself, by itself. And also, in, uh, the, the OS being applied to all of these digital devices means it's another technology called IDE, Integrated Development Environment. So it's like you can, the, since the OS, as it's applied on all of these devices, you can, for example, set use your phone to control everything in your home. For example, a television, uh, 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 the uh, air conditioner, and it's going to make our life a lot more convenient, just like in the old times, you know, science fiction movies. Nice. So, Sangeeta, I want to ask you, um, is if you happen to know of anything um, similar that might be happening in India or being developed in India, especially being at BMS College, I imagine that there are a lot of like computer scientists and engineers that would be interested in, in an innovation like this. Uh, yeah, so I have recently heard of this operating system which was launched by the CDAX, which is a startup by computer science students of few uh, Indian institutes across India. And uh, they have developed this operating system called Bharat Operating Systems. And it, it basically is available in like 19 languages and it could decode between uh, the English and the Indian uh, ethnic languages as well. Uh, so this is one of the specialities of the Bharat Operating Systems. and. Uh, it could be opened in the desktop computer, in laptops and server computing, 
and even ipads too so it's a recent development in india i think it was just invented like uh, six months ago i just read it in the news segment it's a startup operating system it's not done by a very reputed company or something like that it's a startup operating system and they're still developing on it nice and just for the folks at home that may not know um how many uh ethnic languages are in india so i think according to my knowledge i might be wrong too but i think there are about 20 two ethnic languages if i'm not wrong awesome and um in china there i i'm not as familiar as well but what would be the major languages spoken in china uh chinese of course yeah mandarin chinese if i'm correct right yes mandarin yeah and then <laughs> Also thinking back to my very limited knowledge, um, Cantonese uh -huh. is not one of the major the official languages language. spoken. It is a major language, but it's more like a, uh, you know, it's like a dialect only spoken in the southern, southern China and not an official language. The official language is Mandarin. Awesome. Sorry to sidetrack you all. I was just thinking about that. Yeah. <laughs> So now we're going to move on to um, the subject of there have recently been three animal species in India that have gone extinct due to desertification. So Sangeeta, go ahead and take it away. Indian headlines in the last few days has been experiencing this as a major environmental concern. So about three to four species of animals have been declared in the verge of extinction. Uh, the last week in India, they have set to become extinct due to the desertification and deforestation. So desertification is basically the loss of land, uh, the loss of rich, enriched land. And this was discussed at one of those conferences that happened at the United Nations. Researchers actually spoke of having a database of about 5.8 million and they have uh, found out that uh, a lot has actually changed in the uh, last 100 years. Starting from about 80,000 to 1 lakh species about 100 years ago, these species have reduced to a number of about 150 in the recent times and this is definitely a matter of great, great concern. Speaking about the reasons of desertification and deforestation, it's due to the indiscriminate expansion of land due to overpopulation and also the agricultural expansion, which is most prevalent in India. Farming being one of the most sought after occupations and everything has to be regulated so that we have to reverse this process back as soon as possible. And speaking about uh, the land degradation, it was also stated that more than 30 to 40 percent of the Indian land has been degraded. And this would definitely affect the biodiversity in the whole, not only impacting animals, but also human beings to a great extent. The entire food chain is also affected due to the process of desertification. So we definitely need to take some steps to reversing this situation back to, to enriching our land with a huge number of animals and getting back our biodiversity. Back to the question, um, you mean, what does it look like in regards to, I guess, species extinction, um, unregulated development of natural areas where you are? Um, you know, like there are a lot of uh, species in China that is endangered. For example, one of the most uh, famous endangered species is panda. It's like there is only like one hundred of like more than some somewhere uh, more than one hundred pandas in China, and there's and they're greatly taken care of now. It is a successful uh, exhibition of how China is taking care of the endangered animals, like they uh, they have special bases. Uh, in Chengdu, where you can see, you know, the baby pandas, every baby panda is, uh, is taken good care by uh, their uh, caretakers and they're 
and also uh, the researchers are trying to, uh, you know, let the panda go back into the wild so that they can somehow get used to the wild environment so they will better survive in the future even without human protection. But I think that's, you know, panda is the kind of species which is specially protective because, you know, probably it's cute. <laughs> but there are also other species that is uh, somehow neglected and there are a lot of those neglected species I'm feeling really sorry for that. And, you know, there uh, also has been some financial problems with the animal, endangered animal protection. I just hope that there will be, uh, more people will try to pay attention to that. I have a question. Like, you know, when talking about the certification, I think a special solution in China, it was launched by a, it was a very popular foresting program launched by online uh, payment provider in China called Alipay. It was like, if you use online payment and you will get, uh, for example, if I scan the QR code to purchase something, I will get five grams of energy and I can accumulate that energy. If we reach up to some sort of amount, for example, uh, uh, several, several thousands of Seven, several thousand grams of the energy, you can use that to plant a tree in the certification area. I have already planned once, so it's quite, wow. it's quite a, you, you have a really sense of achievement when you accomplish that goal of planting a tree in those areas. It's quite a creative solution. And I want to know if there is uh, also, you know, these kind of programs against the certification uh, in India. So I haven't heard of any like creative solutions like this until now but i know that the environmental ministry is taking some very extreme steps uh, to energize this process of afforestation so one of these programs that i have heard about is the national afforestation program uh, it basically aims at uh, the afforestation of degraded forest lands and also to improve the quality of forest covers in India. So apart from that, I've like heard about a lot of NGOs that take part in tree plantation activities and I'm part of one such NGO too within my college and there are a lot of corporate services that also indulge in such activities to boost up the environment with their kind of help. So I haven't heard of like creative solutions like this as such but there are a few formal programs uh, been implemented in India. I think that it's, it's going to be really, really important for technology to take a stand in environmental protection. And I think yes. it's really incredible that we're seeing these kinds of things where you can earn points and energy to, you know, have a tree planted. I've heard about this from some other companies that are trying to plant trees and they're using technology to create incentives for, for people to care about these kinds of issues. And I'm not yes. sure if you all have seen it in the international news that um, parts, portions of the Amazon were on fire and the oh, Amazon yeah. being yeah. one of the largest, you know, biodiverse ecological centers mm -hmm. in the world um, mm -hmm. there's a lot of conversation around what that fire could do to the entire planet and i think that yes we've got to um integrate as much of the environment as possible into our everyday living outside of it just being our food you know, we have to think about where our food comes from. We have to think about the environment where our food grows. And we have mm -hmm. to think about environments where animals reside and where their food grows and how we can uh, protect that. Because if we don't, then we ourselves as human beings will no longer exist yeah. in time as well. Yes. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is really cool. And, I'm, and I hope you all keep me up to date um, for things like this because you can you know, as a Melton Foundation, disseminate this kind of information around technology and how the environment can be encouraged or environmental care can be encouraged through technology. Is there anything else either of you would like to mention on this topic? 
Okay, so then we'll be moving on to our last topic of today's podcast, and that is... Ooh, uh, okay, uh, it's hard to pronounce. I do, <laughs> I, I'll say it. Yeah, the Please topic is... <laughs> The topic is about a phenomenal film in China. It's called Nurja, and mm-hmm. it's now the t- China's top grossing animated film, and it's now on the second place on the box office chart, covering all the films that has ever screened on China mainland, which is quite impressive, because you can hardly imagine that an animated film take over the second spot in all-time box, chart, uh, box office chart. Because usually people think, because usually, you know, animated films are watched by child, are, are watched by children or juveniles. But this, this movie is actually, it's just so, so, so popular in China. And I want to uh, tell you why this is, it was so popular. First of all, everybody literally know about the, the story, Nurja. It is a traditional legend that is very, very classic. Uh, the story was about uh, the hero, uh, the little hero called Nurja, who was taught by a god from a young age and learned martial arts and magic, and sort of like, you know, sort of like he has acquired superpower from a young age uh, through a lot of learning and practice. And he did a lot of things, for example, in wars, he led the righteous side to victory. Also, when natural disasters came about, he protected the whole town. And uh, this legend is so well known and has been adapted to several, uh, has been adapted for many times. For example, I grew up watching a cartoon called The Legend of Nurja, and it is definitely one of my all time favorite cartoons. It's amazing. <laughs> so, a lot, so, almost everyone in China knows about the story, but you know, since it's so well known, it's also kind of hard to make it, uh, to adapt it. But this movie successfully done that because, uh, like this movie, uh, was quite innovative, inspiring. Because usually when we look at the story of Nurja, we hardly uh, notice that how rebellious Nurja is actually is. But this movie completely shown that Nurja was born was uh, in this film. Nurja was deemed to born with dark soul like he was born to, he was destined to become evil. But, so the people in town knew that and thought, oh, he's a, he's a bad boy, of course. But Nurja him, he himself didn't thought so. He tried to find his destiny and to become a good people. But, you know, just the villagers, they don't believe in him. So he was, he was faced with a lot of pressure. Of course, he, uh, but in the end of the film, he had done this kind of nirvana of him. But it is, but there is a classic line in the movie called, it was like uh, the prejudices in people's mind are like huge mountains. Yeah, I think that's the, the I, personally, I think that is probably the best line in the movie. Another reason I think that why this movie is so popular and inspiring is that it somehow points out the future direction for China's animation industry. The animation, uh, in the past, a lot of people, including me, think that we look down upon our domestic animation industry. We think that it's a lot worse than those in Western countries and also in Japan. So, but you know, in this movie, we can see that the animation shots were fantastic. The movie, uh, the music that went with it, went with it was also amazing. So it pro- so it showed us that kind of possibility that. Uh, the Chinese animation films can also be that good. You can, uh, the movie makers can draw inspirations from traditional stories and bring life to it again. And, you know, uh, so this movie was uh, literally almost everybody uh, from everywhere in China, of every, of, uh, no matter what age it is, uh, they go to the cinema and watch it. And when, and walk out praising it and tell people around them how good this movie is and you should watch it as soon as possible. I think uh, last of that is uh, this movie is uh, in theater uh, now in America. Yes, so, in a couple of selected theaters. Uh, it's so cool. And yes, it's a really nice choice to watch. Okay, so much for this.
All right, any questions? Okay, so something that I'm personally curious about. Mm -hmm. um, so when, oh, not even personally curious about, I love animation. I am someone who doesn't watch very many things with live action people. So I'm, I'm definitely mm -hmm. someone who watches more animated films and TV than anything else. And what I've noticed is that um, we as uh, people who are consuming animation are doing a much, much better job of incorporating moral stories into the things mm -hmm. that we're showing children. And mm. the fact that this movie is about um, someone who was quote unquote destined to be evil and them mm -hmm. saying, no, I, I, I'm going to create my own destiny and I'm going to fight through the stereotypes and, and what you guys yeah. think I will be and I'll come into my own, I think is a really important message for children. Um, I also think it's a really important message for adults. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Probably that's the reason why it was so popular across all ages. Mm -hmm. And also the the hero of the movie Nuda, there was some controversy before the uh, after the first trailer of this movie came out because uh, in the old adaptation adaptations of the story, the hero Nuda was looked very cute, but in this version, it actually looked not that good, kind of ugly. If I if I am allowed to say so. But uh, after the movie was in theater, everybody changed their opinion. We started to realize that the most important thing about uh, an animation movie is not how good looking the character is. Instead, it's how uh, like the storytelling, the kind of spirit that is trying to convey it. I think, and we are starting to realize that. That's awesome. And I think mm -hmm. what is probably something that that it happens because we start incorporating more realistic looking characters. Like, no, not yeah. all animated characters or not all heroes are attractive. Yes. And so I think it, it, that's also another really important message. Um, and to piggyback off of that, I'd like to talk to you both about beauty yeah. standards because this is very much related to what we identify as being attractive. So if either of you would like mm -hmm. to talk about the beauty standards in your respective cultures, what would that be? Um, yeah, uh, when I think of the beauty standard in China, it's always like, I think it's quite weird. Like people are trying to be extremely skinny. Uh, the, the beauty standards in China are encouraging girls uh, to, uh, for example, if they're one point, uh, like they're going to be really, really skinny and they have the standard, they have the same uh, beauty standard for every girl's face. Like they have like how big their eyes are supposed to be, what, uh, how their noses are going to look. And I think that this beauty standard is somehow uh, greatly influenced by our pop, pop culture or the you know, the faces of the actors on screen. But I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a healthy trend to grow because I don't just, you know, people look different and it's normal and you should not, and you know, the society just shouldn't encourage every girl to look the same. And yeah, just being who you are and be on, the, be on your right track. That's all about beauty, I think. And also, you know, the, the, the being skinny, it's not, a, it's not even healthy. Mm -hmm. So every time I, I see the, the, the beauty standard in China, I just think of what is wrong with this society. <laughs> I think that might be a universal challenge when beauty standards in the world seem to only incorporate a very, very small population of people that would ever fit it in the first place. This sort of like exclusivity because mm -hmm. only this many people did just a minor percentage out of everyone would ever fit into that yeah like you were saying it's particularly for girls men also men and boys also go through this as well but uh there seems to be especially in the media very mm -hmm. very very explicit ideas about what beauty is so passing it over to sangeeta let's talk about the beauty standards in india yeah, 
so i feel that the beauty standards in india are equally weird too so sure also it's as equally judgmental as uh, yun may spoke about people are judgmental about looks they uh, speak about how long one's hair should be how their nose should look how skinny they are and stuff like that so i think the indian mentality and society should uh, go into a change as a whole because beauty is not just the outer self but it defines more in the inner self that you are so i think that the indian society also has to change in its approach and how they measure people not by uh, their external beauty but about how nice and good they are from the inside mm-hmm. i think that we have a really we have an obligation as human beings to try to you know get rid of things that are that are toxic and i think that children's animation and children's movies at least now in comparison to when i was younger without saying how old i am in comparison to when <laughs> i was younger um they've done a lot better a job of making the characters diverse and to emphasize what the characters inside beauty is versus the outside but of course it's yes. in the united states with disney um disney is a huge proponent for why we have very very unrealistic beauty standards and there sure. are smaller animation studios and even folks at disney that are doing um what they can to sort of get in front of that and try to change the narrative around what is beautiful because these beauty standards are so dangerous they're so dangerous and particularly for young people who are still trying to find out who they are in the world and so you have things like eating disorders um social phobias all of these things because it must be difficult and i i imagine it's difficult for everyone to see that only very very few people fall into what the beauty standards are and there is this incredible race and investment in from media for everyone to try to attain something that literally only a, less than a percent of anyone's population could be anyway So it looks like we're coming to the end of our podcast. So thank you to you both for being on the Hot Topics podcast. We really enjoyed your insight and hopefully the conversations continue online in our MF channels and on our social media. So if you are not already following us on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, please do so that you can stay in the loop for all of the things that our MF fellows are doing. And until next time, we'll see you later.